All right, so we're going to talk about respiratory protection. And as you guys know, um, very, very important in the uh, chimney industry, no doubt. Um, this is going to be part two, uh, part one. I'm presenting this in two parts. Next, the second part will uh, be next Tuesday morning. So we want, you know, our objectives are to understand the work requirements for respiratory protection, understand different types of respirators, learn how to select the proper respirator for your workplace, understand how to use them, how to inspect them, how to clean them, how to maintain them. You know, a lot of that stuff will be next week, but between two weeks, we'll, we'll cover it all. So, respiratory hazards are dangerous because often they're unseen. Uh, they're difficult to identify. We have to try and identify exactly what the stuff is that we're exposed to, because if we don't identify it, we can't properly select respirators. And, you know, all of this stuff um, is, a, is a factor of time. Um, you know, the longer that you're exposed to any workplace hazard, the more likely it is to have a, have a negative impact on your, on your health. So respirators are fairly commonly used in the workplace, over 5 million workers a year uh, using them. Uh, but a lot more people should be using them and aren't and get sick or even die as a result of not using it. Um, OSHA estimates that 66,000 workers a year um, may become ill because of exposure that's not properly protected. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant number. We need to, you know, up our game with our employees. So OSHA has pretty extensive rules about the use of respirators. Uh, those are covered in the general industry standards, 1910.134. Um, and there's requirements in there for both employees and employers. So let's look at the employer responsibilities and what they're required to do. Uh, probably the most important thing is identifying and evaluating the respiratory hazards in the workplace. So you have to do basically a job hazard analysis to find out what's out there in the workplace that your folks are exposed to. And then based on the hazard analysis, identifying the hazards, you need to develop a company respiratory protection program that properly protects the employees from the hazards you identify. And you have to provide a medical screening and a fit test um, before assigning respirators to workers. You uh, need to select and provide the appropriate respirators, again, based on the workplace hazards. And of course, provide training on the safe use of respirators, when to use them, when not to use them, how to care for them, maintain them, clean them, and inspect them. And then OSHA also outlines employee responsibilities with respect to re uh, respirators. And they say you need to complete your medical screenings, uh, fit tests and training before working with respirators. Use respirators when required, when directed by your employer. 
clean and, in, and store your respirators properly and report any new respiratory hazards to, you know, company management, supervisors, or whatever. You know, workplaces are always changing, so if a new hazard comes up, let's make sure everybody's aware of it so we can take appropriate action. So, identifying the hazard. Uh, the employer must survey the work area um, in all the work processes um, to identify possible respiratory hazards. So this should be a part of your overall company job hazard assessment. Um, not only with respect to respiratory issues, but employers need to do a hazard assessment of their entire work operation and identify all of the hazards. Um, and then establish effective safety protocols to deal with them. You know, it could be scaffolding, it could be, you know, hearing loss from loud vacuums, it could be fall protection. Anything that your employees are likely exposed to, you need to identify, create systems uh, to prevent accidents and injuries, train your workers. You know, it's kind of a never ending process of evaluation and training. So um, the, the assessment needs to, to realistically predict what the hazards are and, and then develop those into your respiratory protection program and into your employee training. So there's a number of hazards. Let's let's look at those. Dust and fiber are solid particles um, that come from grinding, drilling, uh, cleaning chimneys. Uh, examples are you know solid particle stuff like silica and asbestos, hunks of creosote, those types of things. Uh, fumes are solid particles that typically come from hot work processes uh, like welding, smelting, cutting, things like that. Uh, sometimes, you know, chimney service guys are, you know, cutting out metal fire boxes, uh, things like that. So that's an issue. Uh, mists are tiny droplets of liquid. Um, that are typically sprayed. Um, sometimes we're spraying, you know, waterproofing applications, things like that. Um, sometimes uh, paint spray um, is used if you're touching up something. Um, and then gases are uh, basically think chemicals dissolved in air that you can breathe, um, and vapors. Vapors are one of the, the big hazards that we deal with. The organic vapors from uh, cleaning chimneys that contain a lot of carcinogens. Uh, these are basically gases that form from solid materials. And then we have our biological hazards. Currently, there's certainly a lot of concern with, you know, the COVID stuff, um, but, you know, biologicals also include animal waste, uh, histoplasmosis, raccoon roundworm, things that we've heard about for years in the chimney service industry. So OSHA would rather you eliminate the hazard from the workplace than protect the employee from it. So if there's a way to eliminate an employee's exposure to a particular hazard, that's the preferred method. Um, sometimes that's, that's hard to do, but maybe it can be done through uh, ventilation processes, uh, in closing the hazard, you know, in a, in a work container, uh, substituting, you know, 
work process is changing your work process to a less hazardous process, things like that. Um, but look for ways to eliminate hazards rather than trying to protect the employee through the use of PPE. So a medical evaluation is required before employees are assigned to use respirators. Um, they must be evaluated by a physician, and this can be done um, through a uh, either in-person medical visit or an online process. Um, there's a, a fairly standardized medical questionnaire that OSHA has provided. Um, and it has to be filled out and the doctor has to review it. Um, I actually have a, have a process for doing this. It's super simple and effective. If anybody, you know, watching this is interested, we can set your company up to do your online medical screenings. Uh, you, get a, you get a portal where you can log in and view the results from anybody in your company that has been tested. Um, and it's, it's fast and cost effective. So if you're interested in that for your company, I can help you out with it, let us know. So again, just to emphasize, employees are not supposed to use respirators until they've been cleared uh, by a medical professional. So let's talk about uh, respiratory protection program, what's required. Um, we need to have procedures for selecting respirators, uh, a plan to get the employee medical evaluations done, respirator fit testing is required, how to use your respirator, how to clean and maintain your respirator, uh, the types of atmospheres and places that we can use it. Um, and of course, employee training and continual evaluation of your program. Uh, you know, periodically, at least once a year, look at your program, make sure it's still effective and make sure it's still protecting the employees. So just a question, where's your company program located? <clears throat> Fit testing is required for any respirator that requires a tight uh, seal around the face piece. Um, employees must be fit tested with the type of respirator they're going to be using. And uh, there's two types of, of fit testing, which we'll talk about. The, uh, the picture here is, uh, uh, qualitative fit testing. It's basically a pass-fail process um, that uses either irritant smoke or a bitter tasting uh, spray. So the two types of fit testing are qualitative, it's either a pass-fail uh, test or quantitative, um, which numerically measures how much leakage. Um, I've been, I recently had a quantitative uh, fit testing done for uh, respirators we use in EMS, and they basically put you in a, uh, a small gas chamber, if you will, uh, and you wear your respirator and they put a sensor inside your respirator um, and then they uh, spray a, a you know a, a non-lethal non-harmful chemical into the room and measure how much of that is getting into your respirator um, so it's it's a fairly you know elaborate process most places of employment use the qualitative uh, fit testing process. And uh, that's, that's acceptable for any respirator up to a required assigned protection factor of 100, which we're getting ready to talk about. 
Fit tests must be repeated when there's any change in working conditions. Different types of respirators are going to be used and uh, at least annually uh, you have to repeat the uh, fit testing process. Fit testing can be done in-house. You get the fit testing kit, which for the qualitative testing is a hood with the spray chemical. <clears throat> and keep in mind that not all employees can wear respirators. Um, some workers will have medical conditions that will prevent them from uh, getting approved. Uh, and some employees may not be able to get a uh, good seal. Uh, the OSHA regs say that if your respirator relies on a tight fit on the face, that you cannot have any facial hair that interferes with the seal. You can have a, a closely trimmed um, mustache, but you can't have, you know, a beard. Um, so that's pretty important. The respirator just can't do its job if it's not getting a good seal. Uh, if you have people in your workplace that, you know, have beards, then they should be issued uh, PAPRs, the positive uh, air powered respirators. <clears throat> so just to note that you know, as the employer needs to know what's going on in the workplace and, and monitor for any changes in that condition. This probably doesn't apply much to our industry because I think, I think we're beyond voluntary respirator use in, in most of the chimney service operations I'm aware of. We're going to require respirator use, but that OSHA does have some specific rules uh, about voluntary use. And basically, if your workplace isn't reaching uh, or exceeding the permissible exposure levels, then you're not required to wear respirators, but employees may choose to voluntarily wear respirators. And basically, in that case, they still need to follow manufacturer's instructions and make sure that the respirator is proper and so forth. Make sure they're using their respirator. Okay. All respirators have an assigned protection factor, or you'll see it listed on the respirator APF. What does that really mean? Okay. Um, it's, it's a numerical value um, assigned to the respirator that indicates its level of protection, okay? A typical half mask respirator, like lots of folks in the chimney service industry use, has an APF of uh, 10. And let me show you, that would be you know, a half mask like this, that has an APF of uh, 10. But let's talk more about what that is. In the chimney service industry, typical respirators that I think are being used are the half mask respirator like this. And I meant to have this handy. The uh, full face respirator which looks like this this yeah. has an assigned protection factor of 50 um, and then loose fitting respirators have an assigned protection factor of 25 and those are like the positive uh, the pappers that have positive pressure but a loose hood or maybe just an elastic seal around the face. So let's further define what the APF is for, okay? Um, basically, a respirator with an APF of 10 will reduce airborne particulate by a factor of 10, 
okay? So if you're dealing with a contaminant that has a permissible exposure limit, you often hear people refer to PELs, PELs. Let's say that uh, the maximum exposure, permissible exposure limit is five milligrams per cubic meter, and you have a respirator with an APF of 10, then you can use that respirator up to a maximum concentration of 50 milligrams per cubic meter. So it basically lets you work in a atmosphere 10 times more dense than you otherwise could have without a respirator. So um, that's what the APF really stands for. Uh, the common ones in our industry, the half face is 10, a full, full face is 50, and the loose fitting powered ones are 25. Um, there's another thing, and we're not going to spend much time here because I don't think it's really relevant to the chimney service industry but IDLH, or immediately dangerous to life and health. Okay, um, if you're in a very toxic environment, then you have to have self-contained breathing apparatus. This stuff uh, can be used in low oxygen uh, environments. You know, typical air purifying respirators like this cannot be used in environments with oxygen less than 19.5%. And these things require special training and we're not really gonna get into those in this program. <clears throat> so let's look at the chimney service industry specifically and what some of the challenges are. Uh, I think the number one challenge is identifying the hazard. What is that stuff we're trying to protect from? And what is the permissible exposure limit? Um, so that's, you know, that I think the biggest challenge and something we've been struggling with for, for a lot of years in the industry. And then once we identify it, we need to also identify the concentration of it. So we need to know what type of respirator to select and also the types of filters to select. So I think the, the current wisdom in our industry, I've got it summed up here. The likely hazards are, you know, creosote, soot, silica from grinding, cutting brick, that type of thing. The vapors, that's a big one. Uh, the airborne carcinogens uh, that we've heard about, um, these are a problem. Um, mist from spray paint or waterproofing and then animal uh, waste hazards. So the, I think the current guidance is uh, that we need organic vapor filtering and particulate filtering. Um, and your respirator should have a minimum APR of 10. Um, I think this is the best guidance we have in our industry currently. Let's talk about historical stuff for a little bit. Um, the, the first account of occupational cancer was published in, in 1775 by Sir Percival Pott concerning the high incidence of scrotal cancer in the uh, chimney climbing boys uh, that were commonly used in Britain in that time. That led to the Chimney Sweepers Act of 1788, which set a minimum age of eight years old for the climbing boys. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, they use small children, not necessarily just boys. Uh, young girls were used as well to uh, shimmy up the chimney and clean out the chimneys. Um, 
and their personal hygiene often wasn't good and it led to a lot of problems. Uh, fortunately, we're doing better than that now. Um, there was uh, a Swedish study that was completed about 2013, so about seven years ago, that provides strong evidence of increased cancer incidence among chimney sweeps, uh, particularly for cancers uh, of the esophagus, colon, liver, lungs, and uh, blood-related cancers like leukemia. Um, and you know they summarized that uh, exposure to carcinogenic agents appears to be the likely cause. Um, the PAHs are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Those are the invisible fumes and vapors that are in the stuff that we're working with. Um, we're measured from barely, barely detectable up to uh, almost 10 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, that's that's well below the permissible exposure level, but because these PAHs uh, often contain carcinogenic material, uh, you know, you just got to know that the ideal exposure is zero. You don't want any of those things in your body, okay? Uh, dust levels were measured at 3 to 19. 18 milligrams per cubic meter and dust has a, uh, a PEL, a permissible exposure limit of five milligrams per cubic meter. Okay, so at 19 milligrams per cubic meter, we're basically four times above the uh, permissible exposure limit. But we can safely manage that with a respirator that has an APF of four or greater, four, yeah. Um, and then a little bit more from their study, the standardized uh, incident ratio for all cancer types in chimney sweeps was 1.3, which means you're 30% more likely to incur cancer uh, if you're working as a chimney sweep but there was a high range of 3.5 uh, for basically lung-related cancers, respiratory stuff. Uh, some other notable ones were uh, cancer of the esophagus was 2.94, liver 2.48, and uh, leukemia, which is a blood cancer of 1.55. So, you know, that study, um, established, you know, that we definitely need to protect ourselves and our employees that are working in the chimney service industry. Uh, we're exposed to some bad stuff. We can't take it lightly, and respiratory protection is, is quite important, very important. So, and that brings us to the end of part one. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, see if there's any questions out there. Um, next week, we'll get into the types of respirators uh, and some information about respiratory training, things like that. Yeah. Um,